those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. That was a warning from President Biden today as he addressed the nation in the wake of suicide attacks in Kabul, which killed 13 U.S. service members and left dozens more injured. The two attacks happened outside the airport where thousands of people were, were trying to get out of the country after the Taliban took control of the country. For more on this developing story, make sure you keep it right here on BNC and BNC.TV. The other big story we're covering for you as it unfolds is the R. Kelly trial in Brooklyn. Today, jurors heard from a woman identified only as Stephanie. She said she was 17 when she met Kelly at a Chicago area McDonald's. She says she eventually began having sex with Kelly and described him as controlling. She added that after their second time having sex, she told Kelly when, uh, that she was 17 and he allegedly said, quote, that's fine. Kelly has pleaded not guilty to federal racketeering and sex trafficking charges, but faces 10 years to life in prison if convicted. Joining me now to break down today's developments from court is my co-counsel, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson. All right, Paul, How are let's you, start Giddy? off with, I'm good, I'm good. Let's start off with the testimony of this third accuser identified as Stephanie. Uh, what stood out to you from her testimony? I mean, there's clearly a theme in what each of these accusers have said on the stand so far. Well, what's standing out to me are the details, not just about what R. Kelly says, but what R. Kelly does. And that to me is twofold. Like while we're listening to this testimony and while we're hearing these narratives about all of this horrendous behavior and sexual abuse and controlling behavior that's coming out in the stand that's damning against the uh, defendant that's on trial here. I, I think in the back of our minds, people want to know, is R. Kelly really saying these things? Is he going to refute these things? And how is he going to challenge what's being said on the stand against him? But what stands out to me is as we're hearing this narrative, there's an extra layer as a jury and an extra layer with us as an audience watching and listening to the testimony because he's a celebrity. And so that in and of itself makes it more salacious. We all want to know what does R. Kelly do on the weekends or during the week? And how does he go to this McDonald's frequently? And that it's known in the community that if you go there and hang out that you may get a chance to see R. Kelly or interact with him. That's the kind of evidence, details, and information that the jury is paying attention to and paying more attention to because he's a celebrity. And the issue is that listening to it because he's a celebrity gives it more credibility because they're paying attention to it in ways that they may not pay attention to it in another context because he's a celebrity, because he's such a well-known name. Those are the kind of facts that get woven into the testimony that make it more credible rather than not. And I'm fascinated with it as much as I'm repulsed by it, just along with everyone else that's listening to it in that courtroom. But that's creating a box that's going to be very hard for R. Kelly to refute from all of this testimony that keeps getting layered upon layer upon layer of consistent behavior and damning testimony against him. And that's before you start even weighing and evaluating how sympathetic these narratives are for these young girls that were treated inappropriately as they were underage. And we haven't even gotten to the young men yet. So that, that, that's, those are my impressions from today. All right, let's talk about what Stephanie said now. She called Kelly controlling and talked about rules he would put in place, everything from how to talk to where to stand. Do you think this is redundant testimony or does the prosecution need to keep building upon this sort of testimony? Yeah, I don't think it's redundant at all, and partially because the charge and allegation here is a RICO charge. So they have to show that he was creating this pattern, that he was executing a practice with more than one person and in more than one way, but those were all consistent things. So even when it wasn't R. Kelly telling them the rule, it was the road manager telling them the rules. It was the security guard telling them the rules. It was the friend, cousin, relative, 
tour guide telling them the rules of how to behave, but was all consistent. And that is building a narrative that points towards R. Kelly being at the center of how these individuals were treated. And that's why he's guilty more likely than not based on the evidence that's coming in so far. And so that purposefully is why prosecutors are sharing these narratives over and over. And they charged it this way, I believe in part, so that they could get in all of these narratives with these dozens of victims with a similar story or at least a similar perspective of abuse and control directed towards R. Kelly, because that's what speaks directly to the charges for a RICO conviction for R. Kelly. All right, so let's talk about the age factor, right? Stephanie uh, testified that she told uh, R. Kelly that she was 17, he didn't care, they still had sex. Um, even though Kelly faces charges, um, racketeering charges, sex trafficking uh, charges, why are these details so significant in terms of the age? I think they're significant because I think a lot of people don't really understand how statutory rape works. And so oftentimes when you talk about this in criminal law, people feel like maybe it's a defense if they didn't know that the person was under 18. And that's actually not a defense. It is a statutory rape when by statute, by legal definition, you are guilty no matter what the age is. And by having this narrative where all of these young girls and boys are, are told that they have to tell people that they were under 18 or over 18 if asked, or that they told R. Kelly that they were over 18 when they encountered him. None of that even matters, but it speaks to the guilt that he has because he knew or should have known anyway, independently of the standards that the law holds for them. And again, He's not on trial for this statutory rape, but it folds into the narrative of proving the racketeering and it folds into the narrative of the charges related to moving underage youth for sexual purposes across state lines. And so in these narratives, what you will hear was even regardless of what they told R. Kelly, that at some point it was made clear to R. Kelly that they were under the age of 18 and he consistently continued in his sexual relationship with them. He consistently ordered them to lie about their age, and he consistently ordered and directed their behavior and transferred them across state lines. And that's how it's gonna fold into the broader likelihood that he'll be found guilty. All right, veteran prosecutor and BNC legal contributor, Paul Henderson, thank you so much as always for the insight.